this time is now. Let everyone in the listening audience grab their scriptures, a pencil, and a piece of paper. Listen and learn the true meaning of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, the Psalms of David, the Lost Books, and the Holy Quran. There are no more secrets. All false things will perish. So come and learn the undisputable teachings of the only man that has the answer to the problems of a troubled world, as Sayyid al-Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. Magnetic centers. 
Each permit creates a magnetic force field to charge ships that pass over, which we all refer to as flying forces. We call them phobic fire. Right? It's yeah. fire by it's charge. That's the Bermuda Triangle is also a school. And it also has a permit of electricity that charges ships. Why they always find UFOs hovering over the permit or over the Bermuda Triangle or over large places where there's a lot of electricity to charge themselves. Did they teach men? Yes, they taught men. They taught Nubians. Yeah, they taught them eye operations and brain operations and things that modern day science are uh, confessing existed in Egypt before they knew anything about it. They're saying, now we know that these Egyptians and these people in Africa were doing great surgeries and having tools to perform brain operations that we just got into this year. How'd they do it? Well, they, they were taught by extraterrestrials who are far more advanced than mortals on Earth. Were they taught religious wisdom also? Religion in what respect? Because Al-Islam is more than just a religion, it's a way of life. Yes. In respect of um, the oneness of Allah? That's emphasized. That point is always emphasized. The elders are called the Elohim. So they had that knowledge prior to uh, Noah. Trillions of years before Noah. This planet is a planet of babies compared to extraterrestrials from other galaxies. No, I'm not talking about the extraterrestrials. I'm talking about the people that were taught by the extraterrestrials. Oh, yeah. Yeah, before Noah. So there are actually two sources of the religious wisdom? Oh, they're all the same, because Noah was visited by extraterrestrials. Okay. All right, I have a question on another subject concerning Canaan. Was Canaan born with a soul? Yes, he was. At what point did the white man lose their soul? Well, Canaan was not a white man. Canaan was a black man. He was albino. He was albina, we call him. Okay. They got up into the mountain, and they was born their soul, because if, if you read the book, you find out that some of the 200 fallen angels came into Canaan's 11 sons, not Canaan. When his wife and him somehow conceived, their sons were possessed of demons. It was at that point that they were sold. Okay, thank you. My question is, if, if our purpose is to get back to the state where the Creator wants us, why are some brothers and sisters not being able to see the truth? Don't want to see it, don't want to hear it? Because the devil did a real good job. So the devil is the one who put the veil. Yeah, the devil has done a good job of, of making them want to be what he is. And he's a failure. Every one of his societies always looks rich, but it always fails. Rome, Greece, Mesopotamia. And this society here is beginning to fall apart. The interior is falling apart now. Watch the news. So our people are afraid as men to stand up on our own and build our own nation. We're just afraid to. We've been living under the white man so long that we, we feel comfortable under his arm. We're afraid to stand up on our own and go for it. And we can do it. So it's the white man that put the, the veil on, on, the, on the eyes so they won't see or hear the No, truth. Allah, because of Allah, 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 Allah will seal anybody's heart who speaks disbelief. If you want to find a reason not to be a Muslim, Allah will help you not be a Muslim. I see. If you want to look for a reason, say, I'm going to find fault in Imam Isa, he'll help you find fault. I'm going to find fault in the community, he'll help you find fault. You say, I want to find righteousness in a person, he'll help you find righteousness. You look at a person and say, I want to find good in that person, he'll help you find good. You look at that person and say, I want to find wrong, he'll help you find wrong. You, you can do it. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I have one question, and it's on a, a verse in a portion of the Quran where uh, Allah commands a people to be as apes. Can you give a, a definition or an explanation of that? This quote is talking to the children of Israel, and it says that because they violated the Sabbath, right? That they shall be as swine and apes. And that's because in ancient Israel, you remember Jesus, he used to cast demons into swine. You follow that? In ancient Israel, the symbol of the ape and the swine was always a symbol of something possessed by a demonic thing. And he was telling the children of Israel, because they violated, maliciously violated the Sabbath, they will be cast down to the level of swine and apes. And that was a curse that was placed on them, which manifested, that's like we were talking about earlier, in their curse of leprosy. See, people think the Sabbath started with Moses, and it didn't. The Sabbath is back in Genesis, when he says, and on the seventh day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ceased from creation. He didn't stop and go to sleep like they say. He ceased from creation and let evolution or things evolute into place. And that day, that seventh day, is the seventh thousandth year of creation. We are only in the sixth thousand. When the 6,000 years of the devil's rule is up, he got his curse before that. And he is like the swine and he's like the ape. That is him. Um, in regards to that previous question about um, the quote Magnum Man and, and all those different um, types of so-called um, pre, 
prehistoric. Right. Um, how do you explain the different artifacts, you know, people that were found? Like, not people, but you know. I don't bother to. See, the difference between me and most people is I don't bother to explain them because of the fact that I believe in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. So I'm not looking for a reason to believe what some white boy in the 18th century named Darwin said. I'm, I'm not interested in what he said because I already believe in the Quran. Now, I've written a book about it and I've attacked the subject for those people who have a little bit of faith trying to strengthen their faith. Personally, I'm not the least concerned with their findings because I know the white man made the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark and inside the caves it looked real to me and you. I know he can make all kinds of things. He made some mummy movies and we can forget while watching it that we're watching the movie. And you personally have never seen any of them personally and if you did, you didn't have the knowledge because he didn't approve of it for you to be able to analyze them yourself. So all we have is his say-so, right? So the choice is between do we listen to what this white guy in the 18th century says or do we listen to the creator of the heaven and the earth? I prefer to listen to the creator of the heaven and the earth. So therefore, I don't even put myself in a position to analyze stones and rocks as our descendants because the Quran doesn't go that way. The Quran makes it clear that Allah created us. Have you understand what I'm trying to say? And when we start to probe, we're showing doubt in the law. When we start saying, well, maybe it's true, then we have to confess we're not Muslims then. We're still not Muslims yet. Because when we become Muslims, we no longer question or doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any kind of way. And if he didn't say that, then it don't exist. He says he created man. So that's what it is. You follow? That's how I look at him saying. And every man has his own right to look at it his own way. I look at it as Allah says it in the Quran, and that's what it is. Because I don't doubt the Quran. And the moment I start to question it, then I'm no longer Muslim. Because the Quran says, don't doubt it. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I understand from reading some of Imam Easton's pamphlets that the Gospel of Barnabas was excluded from the Bible because it had too many truths in it, correct? And uh, the other day I bought this book from um, one of the brothers, this Gospel of Barnabas. And I read in here that um, before the day of judgment, there's going to be 15 days, whereas there's a sign for each day. And afterwards, like after he explained that what was going to happen, he said on the 15th day that the 15th day the holy angel shall die and the law alone shall remain alive to whom be honor and glory. Is that true? In the book of Revelation, when they say we're going to wipe away the heaven and wipe away the earth and bring in a new heaven and a new earth, correct? Mm -hmm. It also says every man must taste death and then he will return to us. You see that? Every angel and every man's light will go out. That the only light that shines on Yawmat Akhri is the light of Allah. And then those who will be rekindled with light will be by the leave of Allah. So the answer when they say the holy angels will die is to say that the light of the angels will go out just like the light of the souls of every man will go out on the last day. And the only light that will shine will be the light of Allah. And then he will select those people that will come back to eternal life. That's why they say wipe away the heavens and the earth. When they say wipe away the heavens, they say, like it says in Genesis, and, and the host of them. When it says, and now the creation was finished, and all the host of them, uh -huh. well, that's angelic beings when their creation was complete, and then the creation of man. Okay? So when Allah says he's going to wipe away the heavens and the earth, all the angels and all men must bow. Everything must bow on the last day. Mm. I okay. have another question, Art. Um... And also in the same book, I came across a couple of things that was confusing to me because I don't know. First, let me make it clear to you that that is not a copy of the real book of Barnabas. That is a poor translation. But a lot of it is they do have some facts in it. That which I can answer, I will. But we are taking it from the ancient Arabic and putting it in English slowly but surely. But there's so many books for one person to write. <laughs> you see, it takes a lot of time. I have a lot of people working with me, but I still have to proofread and research every individual thing. So I may put preference on a subject. I started doing the books of Barnabas. I have like four volumes out. Then other things, questions stirred my attention somewhere else because I tried to write books according to what y'all need to know. Okay. So is it okay if I ask these other... By all means. But if it's something that is not, you know, not, not translated properly, I'll just say it's not translated properly. Okay. Um, also in this book it says, if you don't mind me reading a little bit of it, uh, Jesus, peace and blessings of Allah be upon was telling his disciples that the faithful, it says right here, but the faithful shall have comfort because their torment shall have an end. And the disciples were afraid of hearing this and said, so then the faithful must go into hell. 
Then he went on to explain whereas that they would be in hell for a little while and that the message of Allah, which is Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he's going to ask Allah this. He's going to say, then shall his messenger speak to Allah and say, Lord, my creator, remember the promise made to me, thy servant, concerning them that have received my faith, that they shall not abide forevermore in hell. And Allah shall answer, ask what thou wilt, O my friend, for I will give thee all that thou askest. Now, Muhammad will say, Then shall the message of Allah say, O Lord, they are of the faithful who have been in hell 72,000 years. Where, O Lord, is thy mercy? I pray thee, Lord, to free them from those bitter punishments. Is that true also? See, here's the understand. When you read Genesis again of the Torah, you find out that you have sun, moon, and stars as signs of seasons and times. Correct? That is in the earth plane. That has to deal with earth. When you step outside of the earth realm, then you're not governed by the same time laws. You understand? You say, if a person says, I live 76 trillion years, the joke is, you don't know whether they mean 76 trillion years of your time. That's the first thing you say is, 76 trillion years by my time, okay. 76 trillion years in an extraterrestrial world could be 30 years in your time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Because as you break the speed of light, time goes backwards. When you get outside of the Earth's atmosphere, the time system is totally different. The further you get away from your sun, where you go into other galaxies, like the galaxy I come from, where we have more than one sun, then our time system changes. You all have one hour per day, and we have three hours. Three simultaneously clocks going at the same time. Three sets of seasons going at the same time, depending on what galaxy you come from. You all always tend to base everything on yourself. Mm. <laughs> all, right. all right, thank you. Um, I have another question, if I can ask, right? Like, I remember in one of your books you were saying when, uh, in the scrolls, when Allah commanded the angels to come down and from the clay make man. Now, I, I remember reading that the clay, well, the dirt, rather, the earth, like, asked the angels to desist from this purpose. Now, what I want to know is that being that we're made from that dirt, are we in, like, in sense or some kind of way crying out like he did in the beginning? Very interesting point. You know what? Because I've been trying to tell people for years that nature is your worst enemy. Your body tries to get sick. You understand that? Your body tries, you will, your body will pull you down the stairs if you're not careful. It will, your intellect will force you to step on the gas. Your soul yearns to be released from the prison of the bacteria of the body or the clay. And the clay is living cells of nature. That's what they speak about when they say that it, that it, spoke towards the law. Every cell in your body is alive. Hmm. Nature is alive. Grass is alive. Soil is alive. All these things live. And these things are bacteria that are plaguing your soul. What do you think you feed? You think you feed your spirit? You feed your body. And you will eat bad food knowing that it is bad for your stomach. You will drink sodas knowing that it is bad for your system. You will smoke ganja, smoke marijuana, take in drugs, Knowing that it can kill you, you will do these things because nature is man's worst enemy. Nature is not man's friend. Nature is constantly trying to return man to the earth. You understand? Mm. And right. that's where man makes a great mistake in thinking that nature's on his side. This is what makes you get up in a high place and that flash goes to your mind. I wonder how it would be to jump. But if I tried to push you off, I couldn't do it. But the flash does come to your mind. You look around. You're driving your car. It's something that makes you say, ah, a little bit faster. You get there a little quicker. And mm, you start increasing in speed. You forget that you're driving a two-ton piece of steel and glass. And what would happen if you get into an accident? This is nature trying to end your life. So how do we, how do we fight against this? The too? thing is, it is not a part of you. Oh. If you want to see the real part of you, Tomorrow morning, when you're washing your face in a mirror, stop and stare for a little while, and you'll begin to get this feeling that the real you is looking from the inside out at the body. Talk to yourself, and you'll make that distinct separation between you and the fake you. The real you is the soul. The fake you is the flesh. Stand in front of that mirror and look at your eyes, look at your nose, look at your mouth, look at your ears, look at your skin, look at the growth of your beard if you be a male. And stare and stare and eventually the question will come to you. 
Which one is the real me? The one looking out or the one the one looking out is looking at? When you make that distinction between that soul and that body, then you realize that if you did a scale, you do more for your body than you do for your soul. You're feeding your body, dressing your body, plucking your eyebrows, combing your hair, parting your mustache, you stand in the mirror, brushing your teeth, grinning and checking in, looking at little pieces of cabbage between your teeth. <laughs> Everything is the body. What do you do for the soul? Someone comes along and says, pray five times a day. Wow, that's a whole lot of prayer. <laughs> yeah, eat seven, eight times a day. I mean, I watched a person try to, you know, the new bags of potato chips are made so you can't open them. You have to put it in your mouth and rip it with your teeth. You no longer can do it with your hand. You know that, right? Years ago, you take a bag of potato chips, you go rip and you open it up. Now they got this made out of this new kind of plastic that you can't even open it. Correct? So you got to really fight to get to this bag of potato chips. You gotta, it really stirs the animal in you. <laughs> All of it for the pleasures of yourself. But how much do you give to Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person says, can you pray five times a day for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I work. I'm on my way. I, I go to school. <laughs> in school, you make time for lunch. At work, you make time for lunch. But when it comes down to the worship of Allah, all of a sudden, you don't have the time. Mm. Can I just look? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, finish. Go ahead. People pray over their food, even. Oh, God, thank you for the food. And then take it and adulterate it with hot sauce and ketchup and peppers and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> First they thank him for it the way it is, and then they add all the poison to it. That's nature trying to destroy you. Believe me. Go ahead. So I wanted to know, like, like, do people actually, uh, like, talk to the devil inside of their chest? Do people actually do that? No, do the we? devil talks to them through inspiration in their chest. The devil is the one that makes you put that frown on your face because he convinces you that that will protect you from people. And we actually answer him back and oh, stuff you, like Well, that. you answer the devil in your actions by carrying out his desires. So, in the You know, let me tell you a story about men. Mm -hmm. I'll show you how the devil works. It's a good time to do it because summer's coming. There's three men standing on a the corner, they're talking. They're holding a conversation. All right? They're supposed to be righteous men. They're standing here talking about the Quran or anything. And down the block, there's coming a girl. She has on tight pants. <laughs> These three men, watch their natures, how they change. Now, all of them see her coming from the right. One guy alters his position so he's facing her coming. And his conversation continues so he can look directly at her without pretending he's looking at her. You understand? Mm -hmm. That's one guy. The other guy foresees it, alters the conversation about women so they all will look. The other guy waits for her to pass and says, just look at that filth. So he can turn around and look. <laughs> mm. You see, the devil, on the other hand, used all three of those men, three different ways. They all answered the devil's call. One of them was direct. He just turned and looked at her and then made like he wasn't looking. The other guy got everybody to look. The other guy made it look like it was such a disgusting thing to look at that he had to point it out so that everybody would see it. That's how the devil works. The devil just puts up signs and we read them. You follow? Yeah. That's his job. The devil is not going to make you do anything. He'll put up the sign and you'll read it and follow. So that's why he's a master of commercials and advertisements. That's so, his thing. So in like manner, do like the, the seraphim or the good angels, people as yourself and others, can they speak to us too when we relate back to them? They sometimes? do. And they're the ones that makes you see a white woman in distress and you step above your narrow-mindedness as a black ex-slave and say, I'm going to help her anyway, because it's right to help her. Mm. Not because she's white, and not because she's black, but because it's right to help somebody in distress as a Muslim, not because they're Christian, not because they're Jew, but because as Muslims, we are Abdullah. We are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have an obligation to all of his creatures. That's when angels are speaking to you. But when you say, I'm a black Muslim, and that's a white woman, and I don't care if she suffers, then you're acting like the devil. You understand? Mm. And many people be, who are right
judges become the devil because they think they're so righteous until they start doing more of the work for the devil than Allah. I'm so right and everybody's so wrong, I don't realize how wrong I really am. Many people deceive themselves into evil. So does that mean that we help the... We help anybody that's in distress as Muslims. Oh. So do we help Shaitan, curse be upon him, like keep the good angels from speaking to us every day? Do we actually help him fight them off for something? Or how come they don't speak to us more? Because you don't open yourself to them more. Because you don't call on the seraphim until you're laying in a hospital bed. Or until you're in a prison cell. Or until things are going wrong in your love affair, or someone in your family dies, etc., etc. Then you turn and raise your hands to heaven and say, why me? You don't ever hunger when you have a full stomach. But man, when it comes to worshiping Allah and adoration, should always be hungry. So if I hungered more at this present moment, I could actually feel those kind of things. The more you open yourself up to them, the more they'll come to you. There's okay. angelic beings, okay. extraterrestrials, waiting to make contact to guide you. They just ask you, all they, all they ask you to do is stay on Sabil Allah. Stay on the path of Allah. Stay on the path of righteousness. That we don't want to do. We want to shuffle and jive and step on and off the path at random. We want to pick them up when we need them and drop them when we don't. It doesn't work like that. It says, he who the Spirit descends upon and resides with him forever. You know him by that. You see that? Mm -hmm. When the Spirit descends, they want to stay with you. Not like Christianity, where people get the Holy Spirit while they're on church and they go home and curse everybody out. Mm -hmm. No, in Al-Islam, when a ruh descends upon a man, it is supposed to reside with him eternally. He's supposed to stay in righteousness. Got to learn to live Islam. And, you, and we have an example in Rasulullah Muhammad. We have his sunnah to follow. The way he did things, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he practiced. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us he was the best of examples for us. He tells us to dress a certain way. He tells us to eat a certain way. He tells us to pray a certain amount of times in a certain way. If we want that guidance, we have to do that. The same thing like if you want to become a doctor, you got to pass certain, you got to study and pass certain things in school, right? If you don't do it, you won't become a doctor. You can walk around and call yourself a doctor. Like there's a lot of people walking around calling themselves Muslim. If you're not wearing a veil, you're not a Muslim. If you're not wearing the sunnah of Rasulullah, you don't have a beard, and you're not doing, if you're not doing the things that Muhammad did, I don't care who you are, what country you say you're from, you're not Muslim. You have follow? You have to do what Al-Islam calls for to be Muslim. If you don't, you're not Muslim. Look how bad you feel. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I was uh, reading a book, and it was uh, referring to light. And it said that light is invisible, but how what we actually see is in terms of solid liquids and gases. And uh, I was just uh, trying to, you know, I was wondering if you could explain uh, something of that nature because you were saying I wanted to taste that once you could see into the uh, etheric rim of existence that there's beings that's all around us, but we don't have a... Uh, we haven't, you know, they have to incarnate for us because we're not able to incarnate them. And uh, I was just wondering if this is why, because... Just a minute, because you're overweighing yourself for no apparent reason whatsoever. <laughs> just turn the Holy Quran to the second chapter. The 255th verse, which is called Ayatul Kursi. And in it, it tells you that you can't see light. Allah, la ilaha illa huwa al-hayu qiyum. Allah, nothing would exist, exist, if it wasn't for Him, the living power, the living strength. You understand? Yeah. So the word exist means what? To be. That's right. Allah, la ilaha illa huwa al-hayu qiyum. So life can be seen because life exists. And he separated this form of life from himself. So they're not talking about the type of life of Allah. They're talking about the life that Allah brought into existence. And if he brought it into existence, it is perceivable. Okay? I 
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I would like to ad address this question to uh, Ali Mamisa. And I would like to know why is it essential that one must move into the Ansar Allah community in order before the year 2000? Unfortunately, because the scripture says we have to, <laughs> because living together with people who have not been groomed to live together is a very difficult task. But in our scriptures, in the books of Revelation, chapter 11, it says, And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the Hekan, which is the word temple, of Allah, which is what they have, of course, God. And the altar, and what's the next one? And them that worship therein. What's the last two words? There, therein. You see that? Not outside. People say, well, the temple is in my heart. Yeah, but your heart is inside you. So that can't be saying that. As long as I'm a Muslim in my heart, that's what counts. It doesn't say that. It says, have yourself counted with those who are inside the temple. Then what does it say about the court? The word court here in the language is dar. Dar means abode or place of dwelling. Or this is a dar you're in. And what does it say next? But the court, which is without the temple. Those people who are outside of the temple, what about them? Leave out. And? Measure it not. Why? For it is given unto the Gentiles. And what did Jesus call the Gentiles? Snakes, vipers. He told his disciples, don't teach the Gentiles. Don't number them with the righteous. That's why. Not because we like living together, that's for sure. Because we have our hard times. But because the scripture tells us we have to. Well, one of my questions is, why is black associated with the devil? Because the white man, as you know, spent a lot of time doing stuff like this. What's a devil dog? A brown piece of cake. What's devil food cake? Chocolate cake. What's angel cake? White cake. Why, what, what color suits do the bad guys wear? Black. What color suits do the good guys wear? White. What color suits do doctors wear? White. What color suits should they wear because it gets dirty? Black. I mean, <laughs> they spent a whole lot of time making black look bad, and that's all part of brainwashing of this Western world. And the first and most important thing is, watch this. Ready? Let's take a Chinaman, correct? The Chinese worship Buddha, right? What nationality is Buddha? The statue of the Buddha is what? Chinese, right? So the Chinese are worshiping a Chinaman. How about the Indian? Krishna. Was Krishna what? An Indian, right? The Indians are worshiping Indians. The Red Indians are worshiping Red Indians. Eskimos are worshiping Eskimos. We're the only ones that worship a white person. Everybody else in the world worships somebody their own color. You understand that? That was a form of brainwashing. And if now, if Jesus is God and God is white, what are you in their doctrine as a people? See, if Jesus was white and he's God then, and we're black, what must we be? We must be the devil. This is subliminal brainwashing to suppress us as a people so we can't see our way to heaven. We can't even construct a mental tower of Babel to get back to the Father because we're God. We're the lowest of the low. We're nothing. We lived in Africa, and we would walk around naked, and we ate people, and one white guy named Tarzan came over and could beat all the animals and beat all the Africans in one fight. This is subliminal brainwashing. It must be uprooted. The white man perpetrated that phoniness about black <laughs> being ugly and evil. Uh, a question about, I guess about maybe about two and a half months ago, uh, someone asked a question about shaving. Uh, I know I, I shave because of this job I'm on, and I probably wouldn't have a job if I didn't shave. Uh, then it's wise to shave if you need your job to survive. Allah does not have compulsory in being. If, you, if that's going to deprive you from supporting your family, you follow? Yeah. Then shave. Allah knows that. Okay, uh, but the question is, uh, why uh, isn't a Muslim supposed to shave? And if, uh, from, from the answer I got last time, uh, it's a, a razor is not to be placed upon your head or your face. Then, uh, oh, that so wasn't from us. I don't know who gave you that answer. That ain't one of mine. I mean, because you shave. I use a razor when I shave and trim oh. my beard. I don't know where they got that from. Okay. All right. <laughs> that answers that question. Yeah, I don't know how they do that. I trim my beard. I keep my beard because the scripture says, do not mow the corners of your head. 
It tells you to keep a trim from a bed. But it, it within my cheek, side of my cheek, I do shave out to hear this. I used to be a student of Dr. Ben, and I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yes, and uh, he'll be working in Cairo, and it's going to surprise a lot of people to find out that he's becoming a Muslim. They're going to be quite surprised that he's converting to Islam. He's going to be working in the university in Cairo, right? Do you're talking about Dr. Ben Jokhanan. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Dr. Ben Yohannes. Yes, the same yeah. person. He's getting ready to become a Muslim. <laughs> that's a great thing. Okay, uh, well, uh, in, in, in times gone by... Uh, in one of his lectures, he did say that Islam and Christianity was brought onto us by the sword and the gun. And I would like to uh, have a better understanding of that. Sure. If you re ever read the fundamental histories of El Islam, you'll find out that before Muhammad left in the year 622 to go over to Medina to set up the community, he was the one being beat up. <laughs> they didn't spread Islam by a sword. They were being beat by the Meccans and all the tribes was in Arabia just because they were trying to teach the word of Allah. They wasn't fighting until after they got to the city of Medina and became a strong community, and then they wanted to come back to their own homes in Mecca, and that's when they started engaging in fights and battles with their own tribal members who were trying to suppress the propagation. Muslims didn't set out to war. You see, here's a perfect example. The Crusades, where was it fought? Was it fought in Europe or was it fought in Jerusalem? It was fought in Jerusalem, right? Yeah. So the Muslims were home, and these people came all the way from Europe over there to fight with them. Yet they say the Muslims spread their religion by the sword, yet the Christians left Europe with swords and came to Jerusalem to fight Salahuddin. The Prophet Muhammad was in Mecca trying to teach the religion of Abraham. The people started beating on them. They stoned them. They put uh, bricks on top of Bilal, Radilahu you Anhu. Know, they persecuted them. They were pushed out of their houses, left their families, and moved to another city where they were welcome lived there, then built a strong party of people and came back and took over Mecca. And then they said they spread it by their sword. They never thought about how they were getting beat up in the beginning, like me and you, right? I, I, you beat me up every day when I'm little. I leave and go and train myself and come back big, and I hit you back. Oh, he's violent. They forget that you were beating me up all the time. You caused me to go form an army, you see? And that's how they interpret Islam as being spread by the sword. Nobody is more violent than American Christians. Because people don't understand when America goes to a country like Vietnam, they're going in the name of Jesus Christ because they're trying to spread Jimmy Swagger over at the same time they're trying to take the country. Christianity is the most violent religion in the world. Everybody on the news that you see, even Brawley and all of them people, are all Christians. Reverend Sharpton, all Christians. The guys trying to persecute them are all Christians. Christianity is a religion that spreads itself by the sword. Something, uh, if you look around in here, uh, um, like in some Christian churches, if uh, you listen to a preacher on the radio, he always says, uh, bring all the sick, bring all the, uh, the, uh, the old people, the people in wheelchairs, and um, you know, walking with canes and on crutches and all that. And uh, I know we have brothers and sisters out there who are in crutches, uh, wheelchairs and all that. And I don't see any of the brothers uh, that are out there solic uh Spreading the word uh, of Islam, approaching these people, uh, I don't see any facilities in here for these people. What if these, should, these people should have a desire to join into the temple or become Islamic? Uh, what we are the provisions people. for them? We have people who come in here. We had several families who brought children in here who were considered crippled and couldn't walk. And after being here for a couple of months, were walking and playing. We don't put up that we're no healers because that's not, what, that's not what the mission is. The mission is to teach the word of the Most High, not to heal people. However, if people need healing, they can be healed. But that's not, I don't stand up as a faith healer, putting on hands, jumping around and all that kind of stuff. That's a big old act to get people's money. And I'm saying, I'm not into that. I'm into teaching people the truth about Allah, the oneness of Allah. That's it. And if they got faith, their faith will make them whole. Any man, he's going he to do this. Jesus said, watch out for people coming like that. That they're going to they're gonna do so many signs and wonders that if it was possible, they'd even fool the elite. you got to be careful of them because it just doesn't work like that. Okay? Uh, and there is facilities there for people who need it. My question is about the pictures that I see around and the pictures I see in your books. All right? What is the significance of including the pictures with the word? That's a very good question. The pictures you see on the wall is real important because if we don't do this, he's going to write them off as white. 
the way he does all other black men in history. He distorts the pictures and gradually alters the way they look. Next you know, they're real, everybody's real light skin. The same way they did the Cleopatra movie and the Moses movie. And people now think Charleston Heston is Moses. And they think that Elizabeth Taylor is really what Cleopatra looked like. And so what I did is, and you happen to be a child that was smart enough to pull the pictures out. 99% of them are so afraid to touch the Bible, even in that state, that they'd never do that. And they start looking at those pictures as they read the Bible and really think that Jesus lived in the village and had a beard and looked like a hippie. They start getting that white Anglo-Saxon hippie image in their mind of what God looks like. And being there telling that Jesus is God, you know what that means they think they are? When they look in the mirror and they see a black face, they think that they see themselves as the opposite of white. Yes. So they teach you that white is the opposite of black, then God is white, then what must black be? The devil. So what I've done is said, like me or not, I'm going to start putting images of black people in the books, regardless of what anybody says, so that the children that read it start to see Moses and Jesus and Abraham and Yusuf and all the people of the scriptures in their real shade and color. The men on the wall are put there so people can remember these great men of our history. Because the white man would love for us to just knock Marcus Garvey and Noble Drew Ali and Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he'd like to lock them out of our history, but he makes sure me and you remember his history, because if you reach in your pocket and took out a dollar bill, you'd be looking at a part of his history. He made sure we got our face on George and, and Abraham and Jefferson all day. He makes sure of it. So I'm not going to be fool enough myself to say it's not important to me, I'm saying. When I think a physical impression in the mind is important, what a person thinks things are oftentimes has a a way of affecting the way they react to things. Mm -hmm. I mean, people become, see a white guy with a beard and they saw a little black kid say, there goes Jesus, mommy, walking to the village. And the mother has to say, no, 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 that's a hippie. And that shouldn't be like that. You know, <laughs> okay? it, it's interesting. It doesn't mean anything, but I agree with you in the sense that there was a certain um, hypnotic um, brainwashing that we've all been under as a result of, of his nonsense, all right? Spell, it's yeah. got to be sort of cleared, removed, Definitely. all right? So when, by whatever means it has to be removed, I'm, I'm all for that, all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing is this. I, I have absolutely no complaints about Ansaru Allah, all right? From the first time I walked on this block, all I felt was love from all of your people. When I come into the place, I only feel at home, all right? There's no other place that I've been between New York, Jersey, Connecticut, upstate New York, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, that I felt that way in, all right? Thank you. That's a compliment. Now, the other thing is that I, I want to come in, all right? I don't work for a, I have my own, my, I do my own thing. It's more or less freelance, all right? There's a number of things that I do to take care of my responsibilities, all right? But I don't refer to it that way. I feel that he does certain things through me so that the things that I need are always there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I have two questions. The first is concerning how we'll be judged on Judgment Day. Uh, my question is, what difference would there be between, say, a grandmother that died 40 years ago versus someone who is on the street, has seen some brothers with the books but never stopped, and also between a person who might come here to class or even live in the community, how, what difference would there be in their judgments? A grandmother who was here 40 years ago before the truth hit the shores, right, yes. will be judged by her own, what do you call it, her intentions in life, not by her scriptural law. 99% go to paradise automatically because they're going to be judged by how they believed as Christians, not how they, uh, how they believe now that the truth has come. You follow that? Yes. In that which they did, you can tell. If a person is a good, good Christian because they didn't know Islam, then you know that if they had been Muslim, they would have been good, good Muslims. So they're judged by their hearts. That's right. Now, a person who walks the street, sees righteousness, knows it's right, and doesn't accept it, is called in the Quran a kafiruna. One who conceals what they know to be true. The translators maliciously translate that as disbeliever. There's no such thing as a disbeliever in the Quran. It's kafirun, from the word kafir, to cover or conceal something. This person in the scripture is classified as like the devil. 
and the scriptures in Revelation says, will be cast into a lake of fire along with the devil, there to abide forever. So those people who see the truth and stall or maliciously turn away, they will be classified as devils, and their abode will be what you are calling hell. Hell is just an script, a way of describing torment. And the torment one will receive is what they think they should get, because you are your judge. And as gross as you think hell is for what you've done, that's exactly what it will be. Hell is like your nightmare, your worst nightmare. You create the nightmare, you torture yourself while in the nightmare. So when you know right from wrong and do wrong, whatever you think hell will be, it'll be that and some more besides. I'm sorry, I was just wondering, if someone just sees, say, a brother on the street, and they see him dressed in white, but they don't know what it's all about, they're totally ignorant to anything that has anything to do with Islam, and they pass by, would they be considered a Catholic because they no, don't take the time? No, they couldn't be. They'd be judged by what they've done. Only once you know the truth, once you've opened the books and read it. That's why, that's why the first thing said to Rasulullah Muhammad was Iqra, read. Read. First thing Jesus told in the books of Revelation is he sent this book and signified by his angel. And those who read this book, he says in the books of Revelation, you see that? And understand this book. So the thing is you must read to understand. So those people who do not understand will not be judged as sinners. They'll be judged by their morals, by their own intentions in life. Okay, so if I'm on the street, or if there's someone that I know personally that I'd like to try to uh, let them know a few things, maybe suggest to them to read, and they just don't want to get into it, what would happen at that point? I mean, is it just over at that point? They're just judged for whatever they... No. You are... See, what happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of all the people in the world, made it possible for you to be in the presence of that person. Do you understand? Yes. So that person is being warned. And they're going to be judged then. You are the warner. See, that's why it says in the Quran, Muhammad is a, a witness over you, and you are a witness over each other. Each one of us, once we know the truth, become a witness. A testifier like Jesus John said, I testify of Jesus Christ. That's what he was talking about. So anybody you try to talk to, Allah sent you to them. And if they turn their back on you, they are classified Catholic if they don't listen. But remember, you have to be in full sunnah. Means full example of what righteousness is also. You can't walk up to them in a pantsuit and expect to convert them to a dress. <laughs> You can't walk up there with a cigarette in your mouth. You know, like parents tell children, they tell children, don't go in the bathroom and smoke. Smoking is bad for you. Uh, honey, go over there and get my cigarettes off the table. <laughs> you can't do that. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. your example has to be right. And when you approach them with the right example, when you're right, then they turn away, then they'll be judged. But if you approach them and you're not right fully, and they turn away, you're the sinner. Because you brought to them a non-perfected way. I see. Shukran. It's a pleasure. Peace. Uh, I got a household situation here. I'm living with a Christian woman, but I believe in the Holy Quran. And our kids, we have four kids, and she teaching them the Christianity uh, lessons too. Uh, being that that I'm a Holy Quran believer and she a Christian believer, what will happen in the future with our relation? The reality of that is, when you say I'm a holy Quran believer, that doesn't say that you're a Muslim. It just says I'm a holy Quran believer. And what Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us to do is to convert people mainly by our example. You follow that? Yeah. The example that you have in that house as a good person, the tenets that you would introduce in that house, the laws on cleanliness, or not in, not drinking or smoking cigarettes, or your good nature will be more influential. There is no difference between a Christian and a Muslim, really. There is no difference. A Christian is merely saying that God came down to earth as a man, and they call him Jesus. All right? Muslims are saying, no, he did not. He's always been in heaven. Now, when you eliminate those two arguments, okay, you come back to what do Christians believe? They believe that real Christians now, if you're good and good for people, you'll go to a place called heaven. Correct? Right. That good Christians, you shouldn't get drunk, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal. So any of the Christian morals that she is putting into the child is not going to hurt the child. 
You follow? And the belief of Jesus being Allah in flesh. As the child gets old enough, or the children, old enough to understand what they're reading in English, they'll see right through it in the Bible themselves. It don't take much. That's why that room is full of people. Because you people in that room are beginning to see that someone told you all a lie. <laughs> you see? And you start to look at the Bible a different way and look at the meaning. Don't be all messed up about it and wrecking yourself emotional about it. Be gentle about it. And you study the Bible. Study the Quran. Study all the scriptures. Respect her for what she believes. You follow what I'm saying? And in time, truth will prevail and false things perish. That's what will happen. This is from the 56th of the Holy Quran, the 8th verse. And we also say a complete for us our life. And forgive us. For surely you have the power over all things.